Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ Envy, Angela Yee, Charlamagne the Guy. We are The Breakfast Club. We got a special guest on the line. Yes, indeed. Uncle Rush, Russell Simmons, welcome. How you doing, bro? How, how are you? Well, well, first of all, where are you, Russ? Because you never right, know. Right now, I'm in my home in Bali. Bali. Um, I got stuck here. You know, I, I live between L.A. and Bali, and, and I was in New York in, in January, and I got on a plane, and Ming was supposed to come. And once I got here, you know, they, they closed the borders, and I got stuck, which is fine by me. Um, so I'm still here. I haven't been back since the middle of January. Wow. Why, why Bali? What's so what's so good about Bali? What do you like about Bali? Oh, man, it's yoga, vegan Disneyland, and okay. also uh, I have work here in Asia. I have a talent agency, and it's in thirteen countries. And Bali is kind of in the middle of all the countries, so it's really a, a great location. And it's it's like people come here for self study and self realization, mm -hmm. and this is a place a pilgrimage for a lot of people to come. And I think life's only goal is uh, to know the self. We say this and, and all the seconds of presence and awareness that we have, those are the results of our good labor. So to continuously move towards that presence or to have it at least as a goal, right? Cause I fuck it up every day, but the goal, this is a place where people study the self and, and they realize um, uh, life's goal. And so but that's what I'm trying to work on. Aside what from all the new business and fun stuff, that's why I'm here. What kind of I have an office in LA as well. What kind of self-realizations have you had? Well, it's an ongoing process. I mean, you know, everything we do is to find the self. All the cars we buy, the houses we buy, the things we, we uh, create, are all so we can have more seconds of presence. So whether it's through meditation or yoga or just do good deeds or any of it, you know, you move a little quick, a little quicker. We're all going towards God, like it or not. Mm -hmm. And we all are discovering the self. But the rate at which we discover the self depends on our effort. So more presence, more happiness, right? That, that's what that is. And any self-study is, is the result is happiness. So you're a little bit happier because you work a little bit harder. Oh, Russ, you know, you lost your um, you lost your best friend recently, Andre Harrell, good friend of mine. Yeah. How, how, how did that impact you? It impacted me greatly. Uh, you know, I was in the middle of writing a book. But I want to go back, but I, if I, I don't know how much time I have. Go ahead. And I want to turn time. You have plenty of time. Oh, okay. Well, the book is, I, I'm writing is called um, Eat to Live, A Post-Pandemic Lifestyle. And I've written a number of books on, on, on vegan lifestyles and diet and these pre-existing health conditions, which is 99% uh, of the people who died from COVID in Italy died because they had pre-existing health conditions and COVID was opportunistic. I lost at least 10 friends. I'm from Queens, I'm 62. I lost at least 10 friends from Queens. Uh, one in Thailand, I lost uh, some in Brooklyn too, two in Brooklyn. So I saw it happen. And I also cautioned so many of my friends on a regular basis about their diet. And so if I can contribute something to our community, it's to support this ongoing movement towards a more healthy diet and healthy choices. I've been a vegan for over 20 years. I pushed the Jay-Z's, Beyonce's, the Jermaine Dupri's. The, I pushed a lot of people till they got headaches listening to me talk about it. To go away from animal product and to do things that would improve their immune systems. And right now in this post pandemic or pandemic moment, and then the, the, uh, the fact is it could come back in a few months. Right. I just want people to be healthy and work with their immune system. So the book is called Eat to Live, A Post Pandemic Lifestyle. And the proceeds, as all of my books, the proceeds will go back into the community. And it's something I'm excited about. And I dedicated it to, to Andre, who was my closest friend, absolutely my closest friend, who I spoke to multiple times most days. And the last conversation I had with him was about his diet, and I plugged him into a doctor in that very last conversation. And 18 hours later, O'Neill found him. I sent O'Neill to his house. 
So this broke my heart and made me even more passionate about wanting to spread this message to our community. We died it more three to six times, depending on where in the country we were, the rate of our white counterparts. And, and so the diet is it's a critical piece of our repairing ourselves and getting ourselves ready for the next pandemic. Now, how did you get to this place, Russ? Because, you know, you're from Queens, same, same as me. But growing up in Queens, there weren't too many healthy options. You know, we had our, you know, of course, your White Castles, your fast food restaurants. You White Castle, joints. You had just stuff you have. You know, we had those. Th those were our options as kids. So how did you No, get but let me say something, bro. When I grew up, we had the West Indians, the weed spot. They sold Ital stew, and they sold ve vegan patties. And I don't know if you realize it, that we're three times more likely than our white counterparts to go vegan today mm -hmm. because of our cultural mm -hmm. input. So we have a really, a, what we call soul food, you know, we have that. But we also have a, a tendency in our community, and especially because of our health problems, to go vegan. So we're more likely to go vegan three times, according to Ingrid Newkirk at PETA, than our white counterparts. So a lot of people in our community are vegan. And we have a, a greater base to grow from. But we have to go because the diabetes and the heart disease and all these other conditions, uh, we are multiple times more likely to have those problems than our white counterparts. And that's our diet for the most part. That's our diet. Russ, you said that you sent O'Neill to Andre's house. What, 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 what made you do that? We were, you know, I speak to Andre, like I said, multiple times a day. And Myself, Tracy Maitland, and another friend of his hadn't spoken to him. So I called, um, I called Gianni, his son, and asked that he spoken to him. And all of us were concerned. So we called his cousin O'Neill and sent O'Neill to his crib. And O'Neill and Cassie went over there, and O'Neill went and found his cousin. And my brother uh, had passed. You know, um, I spoke to Andre, too. I, I guess they said he passed on a Thursday. I spoke to him that Tuesday. And he was actually, I mean, he was speaking to me about a lot of things, but he was speaking to me about a conversation that you, him, and Maxine Waters had. That's good that you brought that up, because that's actually something that today I wake up really enthusiastic and inspired, because I've been working for over 30 years on police brutality. Ever since After Police came out and Cop Killer, I was the one that had to make sense of those songs. I had to go to Congress. And I worked with in New Orleans and Detroit and Baltimore and Philly and various different places with the Nation of Islam. I would go to the police sensitivity trainings. And those trainings were good and the, and the dialogue between police and community was good. Sometimes those things pacified community. Sometimes they were done with good intention, mm -hmm. but they never really represent systematic change. Mm -hmm. And for all of this time, I, I've always, whether I work with National Organization of Black Law Enforcement, no, noble or other police union people the one thing that was always troublesome in our police policing system is that the prosecutors have never had the right to prosecute police they've always been under the thumb of politics and if not politics they're under the thumb of the police union and so when a prosecutor gets a feather in his hat for prosecuting someone or convicting someone that's the norm but if you convict a policeman, you get a hatchet to your throat. Sure. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's a whole different world. And so that's the way it is today. And so when they talk about police reform, and I'm excited to, that they have now a bill that they just introduced yesterday, yep. that's exciting. But when I watch the news, we don't talk as much about that prosecution point because police accountability is the core of this discussion. So if we, don't, we have strong prosecutors who are free from the, the threats of the police unions who can get reelected without the police unions or a government, a national uh, government choice where each prosecutor reports to that one part agency and is not responsible to the politicians, then we have something to talk about. And then we can also prosecute the man next to the man. That will keep a good cop responsible for his partner. So this, those two things are very, very important. And I know they're talking about defunding and not using that language, but it's very important that we get some of that police money 
into the hands of people like our friend Erica Ford That's right. and all the peacekeeper programs that I've worked with over uh, across the country. They need right. money because they're the ones who've been fighting the crimes in our community. Absolutely. Listen, you don't fuck with de Blasio, right? Yeah, I spoke to de Blasio, I, yes, recently. Okay. Are you, are you, how involved are you still in NYC politics? Not so much. I mean, you know, I'm very uh, c concerned and excited at the same time about how this bill goes. And see, young people brought us to a point we wouldn't even believe we got here. They got out in the street. They were enthusiastic. They're hardworking. They are dedicated to change. And what we need now is to make sure the steering committees, you know what I mean, whoever they are, people like you, you know, leaders of young people, get them on a page to push for the change that they really need and not to make a choice for them, but to present them with the options. That option that I told you about has not changed for 30 some odd years. That's mm -hmm. my short watch. Right. For over 30 years, the prosecutors have been afraid to prosecute police, as you know. And before that, I'm sure as well, I just don't have the experience seeing it. So if young people continue to push and they know what they're pushing for, like that bill that the Black Caucus introduced yesterday, then we will see some real systematic change and it's the beginning of something new. Also, just to see the world waking up to the suffering of black people around the world, I never thought I'd see that. I never could imagine that I'd be this blessed to see this coming um, at this time. So I'm thrilled to be part of it in any way possible. I've been calling the members of Congress that I know, the older ones who have become senior now, on a regular basis about this. Mm -hmm. And now we have a bill, and now we have to get the Senate on board on top. I'm sure the Congress will be fine. And we have to you know, close this shit out. We got to move it forward. Yeah, the, the Justice Policing Act of 2020. Now, Russell, I want you to do a grounding before we get into this next line of questioning. Do a grounding. OK. okay. I'm grounded. Well, before we do that, I just want to say, Russ, that you're in Bali and your Wi-Fi is better than Charlemagne's and he's in Jersey. I just want to, I just want to say I that. built this house here. This crib I built is immaculate. <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful. Um, and you know, it's, it's a nice base. I mean, I'm back and forth to LA a lot, but I, I'm very happy here. I was surprised when I came here to get out of the media. Mm -hmm. And I know it's part of the next round of questioning. Mm -hmm. uh, and I came back three or four or five times before I started building. And so, I want to build, I want to teach teachers uh, yoga so they can teach people to get out of the suffering. Right. It's one of the things I care about is to get people out of the suffering and into self-study. And so I'm building a school for teachers is one of the things I'm doing on my property. Wow. So, wow. Now, have, yeah. have, you, have you watched On the Record on, on, on HBO? I have not watched it, but I'm aware. You know, when I first heard about this uh, documentary, I was thrilled to know that Oprah was involved. Really? Because I thought, and I told many people, it was impossible for her to go forward. Well, let me back up, because it's very, something I have to say is much more important. Right. I'm guilty of having been, uh, of having underwritten, supported, made the soundtrack for, taken advantage of, and lived in a grossly unjust society. I helped write the song, I'm a Ho, with Houdini. I changed the, one of the lines into the curse word. I said, y'all niggas could curse after every show, right? I made that. I made the movie, How to Be a Player, and Bill Bellamy played me. So I know what I'm guilty of. And I've been unconscious as a playboy. And today, the title is Appropriate uh, Womanizing. So I'm guilty of that. And you know, back then, I thought it was a game. I was watching Boomerang recently. I, was, I, I dated, if you remember the 80s, and you must remember Robin Givens, and, and I had a crush on, I had a great relationship with Ray Don Chong, and I fell in love with Troy Baya. I dated Sherry Headley from Coming to America. I went out with Stacey Dash. I, there were no black actresses that I didn't date. They're my friends today. Um, also the Dutch and German and French and Angolan and Tanzanian and South African supermodels. I, I went out every night and I looked for new girls to date and almost all of them are my friends today. In fact, every one I mentioned certainly and all the ones I'm referring to when I talk about supermodels from all over the world, these are my friends today and they would never, they don't have the experience of me being the monster that the movie makes me to be. 
Um, so I was thrilled that Oprah took on this movie because I thought, well, it's impossible for Oprah who has so much integrity. There's a great teacher here who told me that um, the teacher told me that God would sort it out. And I said to the teacher, would that, would God come in the form of an investigative journalist? And so enter Queen Oprah, who herself is an investigative journalist. Mm -hmm. And I said, it's absolutely no way she's gonna go forward when I present her with 30 witnesses or so who came forward after they saw their friends and children and parishioners on television. And so um, I felt very confident she'd walk away. She walked away and she did say that the stories had inconsistencies, not one, but all stories, all three girls who were the lead. The stories should not have been printed based on the information I've given. And NBC, New York Magazine, CNN, and many people have passed on those stories. And finally, Oprah and Apple. So I'm sorry that the movie is out, but at the same time, I'm glad they had their moment to say what they wanted to say. I could never say that someone doesn't feel victimized. 30 years ago, these stories are 25 to 40 years old. I can't say someone doesn't feel victimized. I can tell you that I don't feel that I victimize them. And how can I say that? I took nine separate three hour lie detector tests by two separate teachers. I mean, uh, polygraph. So I just want to share that. Uh, they're available to you. And I just wanted to say that, and I don't know what else to say, except I feel terrible. One of the things that happened during the, the uh, investigation that Oprah did was I told her that I felt I read Jane Lamette's report and I believed her. It broke my heart when I read it. I never heard it. 30 years later, I read it, I believed her. She said she got in the car and the car door locked. My first instinct was, shit, car doors locked in 1990. Loud, Cadillacs. So I'm, it was a misunderstanding, as far as I can tell, because I believe her. But I also passed nine tests because I believe me, that are 95% accurate. And the chairman of the Polygraph Association of California is a pretty credible polygraph examiner. So I did. I, I feel terrible about the women who may have felt victimized. I am certainly not a monster or a victimizer. And that's, that's um, as much, that's a lot more than I wanted to say about it. But there's at least 10 articles in black newspapers that are available to, for anybody to read. Ebony Magazine has a story and Washington Examiner, many. And no, they'll the investigative reporters and any investigative reporter will tell you that those stories shouldn't have been printed, much less made a movie about it. So uh, that's, that's the question and that's my kind of re response to you. Is now, Ron, what do you say to your daughters? Because you know, I've seen your daughters defend you. You have two uh, lovely daughters. So what do, you, what do you tell your daughters at, at a time like this? Well, it's, you know, this, we've lived in a very toxic masculine society. But I tell them also, as a person who studies this eminent rise of the divine feminine, which is happening in us and around us as men. That's right. Inclusivity that we need for women going forward is critical to the survival of the planet. That women have to take their rightful place in leadership and as roles that are more meaningful so that we can survive. Whether it be the abuse of animals, the planet, or each other, we need thoughtful, compassionate leadership. But I want my daughters to have proper boundaries because toxic femininity is when one perhaps uh, may not put up those boundaries and may regret it later. So I want my daughters to know how to say no. And I want my daughters to put up boundaries and be strong and be leaders. Um, I want them to have a voice. And so I teach them that. And I'm not suggesting that anybody had to have but insensitivity is a trait for those of us who are greedy and want what we want. And I want my daughters to be able to say no. 
Russell, how many women have come forward at this point and uh, accused you of sexual assault? Six or seven. You know, I also, it's a very interesting point uh, you asked me because I, I noticed that when Les Moonves or someone like that was accused, they didn't say that a girl you spoke poorly to was a number. They didn't say that uh, a masseuse from 30 years ago who said you propositioned it was a number because he had 30 of them. They didn't say that in a yoga class that you were adjusting somebody it looked like you might've been wrong, but it wasn't a girl, it was another girl watching and they made that a number. When, they, when my story came, there were 25 white men. I was the only man of color. They spent a lot of money digging into my past. The New York Times, the LA Times, New York Magazine, and others spent a fortune calling every person that I've known over the last 40 some odd years. So I'm not suggesting they shouldn't, but did they do that for the famous rock stars? I hung out with Mick Jagger and Steven Tyler and many, many rock stars. The misunderstandings that I refer to and the, and the insensitivity that I might have exuded at that time was kind of typical of the time. And they, you know, it was a perfect timing and a perfect storm. So this is my experience. I think God gave me these experiences so I could grow and so I could be useful. I mean, I'm a unlikely ally. I've always been a supporter of the women's movement and I'm an unlikely supporter, but I am. And I believe that what's happened in Me Too is fantastic and it will continue to open more doors for women and change the relationship between men and women to we have a balance where we can better govern the planet and better be, uh, be more compassionate and more loving. And men can, can uh, share in this growth of the divine feminine and be part of it and grow from it. You know, Russ, when you talk about misunderstandings, because, you know, you're a totally different, different person back then. When you're a powerful man and you have women working for you in the industry, you know, if you do, you know, push up on them with some type of sexual advance, sometimes women feel like they can't say no. Do you ever think you put a woman in that situation? Well, here's the thing, you know, I said when I was uh, back then, I, I didn't date the women in the office. I only have one person who ever asked for her, um, her expenses. And then one year later, sued me. I have no sexual um, misconduct of any kind in Def Jam's whole history, except the one who was the lead in this movie. I sent you something which I, I didn't share with anyone else, uh, a few people. I don't know if you got to see it. Uh, but, you know, people can also reinvent, reimagine, or regret and reimagine. Um, and, you know, I didn't, I don't use, I don't want to re victimize women. If someone has accused five people, it does matter a little bit. If they've accused five people, you have to see if the other four are guilty as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's part of the, 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 any prosecutor would ask you, have you ever accused someone else of this crime, the same crime? So and I do believe the answer to your question is, I, I didn't think it was appropriate. I, and, but back then it was pretty normal to have relationships in the office. But I was never interested because again, it was those actresses I named and all the supermodels. And I was much more interested in what was outside my office. I had a president who was a woman. I had a president of promotion who was a woman. I had a president of A&R who was a woman. And I had a president of marketing. At one time, there's a picture that I have that I, I pride in in 1992. It was the women of Def Jam. The first black woman president of a music company was Carmen Ashurst. The head of A&R was Faith Newman. Donna Moore was the head of marketing. And so we had all women running Def Jam at the time. And I was, you know, and they were my partners and friends and we went to work every day together and we enjoyed uh, a lot of success during that time. So we did have a very, and I'm not saying, oh, I had great women working for me because I heard that before. Nor have I heard, by the way, any man defend himself. I didn't want to get into this. When I tell you I took nine lie detector tests, I must think I'm innocent. They oh. say your subconscious will catch you if you're lying. Mm -hmm. uh, but, so I, I talk too much, it doesn't work. 
what I want for is, what I really want is healing. And I don't want anyone who feels violated to know how deeply sorry I am, especially what I said about Jay Lamette. I told Oprah, you will find that the three leads in your movie are absolutely not credible. And there's no way you're gonna make this movie. But I told her then, there's a story that broke my heart with Jane Lamette's story. And when I read it, it made me cry. A week later, she told me Jenny was in the movie. I haven't seen the movie. Mm -hmm. But I understand uh, that story breaks my heart. And it's a story of I got in the car and I was afraid. And, and, and I, I listened to it and I realized that I was perhaps insensitive. But what I wasn't at the time was a mind reader. Today, well, she's, I would have been. Jenny yeah. Lumet said she said no, like 10 times or something. No, she right? didn't. No, she didn't. Not Jenny. You mother a different story. <laughs> but listen, sis, uh, I know that people's pain bodies make the choices as to whether someone is guilty or innocent before they read and hear the stories. Mm -hmm. That each of us has experiences where they can, um, because of their previous experiences, will feel predisposed to one belief system. This is a very polarizing issue. When I told you that I went out every night and had a different girl and I put, so, I put myself in so many compromised situations, I hope you can imagine that maybe some of those could be misunderstandings. Um, and, I, and I don't know how to explain to those who have that predisposition what to think. And I don't wanna make them think anything. I want the world to heal. These are stories that are 25 to 40 years old. And they're stories I don't recognize as true. And they're stories that I, I feel compassion for those women. I don't want to re-victimize them, those who are actually in the room with me, because some are not in this movie, um, including um, the lead, Sherry Sher. So I don't want to go into detail, right? Mm -hmm. I just want to say that I'm deeply sorry for whatever is hurt. And it was never my intention and that I really want to be useful in driving this new humanity that is inclusive of women and inclusive of everyone, really. You know, Russ, back in the day, you was on cocaine. You was drunk. All of y'all were on cocaine. It was the 80s, early 90s. Is there any uh, way you could have misconstrued these sexual experiences or even they could have misconstrued the sexual experiences? Yeah. No, I'm not saying, listen, absolutely, there's a way that some of these experiences, except that I was sober by 90. So I'm going to say that. So yes, of course, I took a lot of drugs. We were all hot. They also, you could have been paranoid when you got in the car and the car door locked, you know, and you did exactly what he said because you didn't want, for fear he might turn violent. You know, when they read that story, it breaks my heart. But like, I, yes, I could have been high and insensitive and unconsciously callous. But I never, ever felt that I hurt anyone. And I even then with all the drugs and all of the kind of experiences that I was living in and the people I was around, it was more street and more culture uh, was tougher. I didn't have a violent vote in my body. So when I take a test that said, no, I never apologize. You said I apologize. I took a three hour lie detector test. That I was never violent. I took a three hour test on that. That I never uh, assaulted you. I took a three hour test on that. Every one of those three hour tests I took, I felt, and feel today, and so does the polygraph, the two polygraph examiners, that I was telling the truth. The misconstrued uh, uh, relationships, I believe, is probably something that not only should we explore in my case, but we should understand that going forward, there's new, there's a new sensitivity mm -hmm. that men should gain, and you know, and 30 years ago it was different. So. Yeah, one I probably said too much. You never win talking. I don't know if any man has ever been able to, to um, no, nah, because people believe people, people are gonna believe what they want to believe regardless. But you, That's do, right. you do you That's feel right. like it has tarnished your legacy at all? You know, I'm less concerned with my legacy today than I am concerned with what I can do going forward to help the community. I feel like what's happening now, my voice has, has been muted to some degree, and this is exactly the, the kind of place where my voice is, is, is useful, at least in my own ego, I believe I should be useful. So the things I wanna build 
the, whether it's the health in the community that I talk about and the diet, I want to continue to promote a shift. I believe that the 200 billion animals made to be born into suffering, that are the number one cause of destruction of the planet and that poison us, we should move away from that, this unconscious behavior. And dominion over the animals did not mean that. And I want to continue to push that agenda. I believe in the equality of women and black people. And I've always fought for those two things. And I, and I was there fighting for equal pay for women 25 years ago. And all of these, and I've spoke at the Women's March, and I believe in the next uh, steps that can take it to be inclusive. And I believe that while I have some blood and any influence, I should use it for good. And so this is what um, I want my legacy to be. I have still have work to do. Minister Farrakhan always says, you know, that until the tiger don't have teeth. And I love when he said that until the tiger, you know, I want to keep pushing and I want to be useful. And I don't want to remain muted. I wrote this book because I care about our community's health. I wrote this book because I think that's what God wants me to do. I'm here in this place working on myself and others. And I believe this next chapter in my life can be useful, not only to the black community, but to humanity in a different way than the other chapters. What happened with comedy and poetry and music and you know whatever financial, whatever stuff I did, even the five charities that I no longer operate. Uh, there's new, philanthropic, social, and political things that I can be useful in, and I want to make that my business. You know, one thing about the divine masculine and the, um, the divine feminine, you know, because I've been doing a lot of research on that lately, too, is the, the divine masculine, well, not even the divine masculine, the masculine is never aware of our toxic behavior. The divine masculine is aware of the toxic masculinity, but when we're in that toxic state, we're not aware. So can you understand why the women who spoke out against you probably felt like they needed to? Well, I can understand why some of them did, because I don't know, you know, if I don't have a direct experience where someone has made many accusations and has done, if I don't have their mother calling me and their father, if so, I do absolutely understand that with all the relationships I've had, that some gone wrong and that some women feel victimized. And I certainly believe them in them cases. In the case, like I said about Jenny, for instance. And I feel that she felt after hearing other stories that she had to share hers. And, and I am deeply hurt by hearing the story, but I'm glad she got it out. And I'm glad I heard all of these things because all of this turned into a blessing that I can be useful in some way in this um, bridge building process that has to go on. We, the finger pointing cannot be the only, it certainly has woken men up, but the dialogue and the bridge that has to be built, maybe I can be useful in that, having had the experiences I've had. What would you say to these women if, if they were in front of you now? What, what would you say to them, if anything? Well, I would say, you know, they're all individuals. Mm -hmm. I would say I love you. And I know that in some cases, hurt people hurt people. I don't want to re-victimize or I don't think we should, I really don't believe we should be re-litigating 30-year-old stories that have never been told either. But I do get why it's so important. And especially as a celebrity, you know, um, celebrities have big voices. Something happens to a celebrity, everyone relates to it. And so as part of furthering a great agenda, there may be some collateral damage. I wouldn't say this to those women, but I would say to those women in cases where, like a Jane Lamette, I'm so sorry. I never knew you felt this way. I spoke to you 20 times after. I had dinner with Drew Dixon a week after she settled her, her, her suit that asked for her expenses. I have witnessed a week after. I didn't know you felt this way. I didn't know, so some of these people who I saw over the years so many, many times who never expressed this to me, it breaks my heart to hear their stories. And I honestly believe that they can, they believe themselves. And it may be, there was a misunderstanding in some cases, where even where I felt, how could you say this? So I can only apologize and the but is not really the answer. 
if you feel victimized, then I apologize. Someone told me if someone feels victimized, then they are. I want to take that to my grave as my mantra, how I treat people. Never mind, you know, feeling righteous about my action. It's how do they feel? What did I communicate and what do they feel? And even if I believe uh, in the back of my head that there was some insensitivity, I still need to apologize. What about, what about uh, people who say you left for Bali to avoid criminal charges? There's no, I don't have any civil or criminal charges. I'm back and forth to LA. I was in LA in December, in November, and in, L in New York in December. I went to, took my kids away. I came back. I spent the first uh, two weeks in January. I'm here now stuck when the borders are opening in the next few days. And I'm back and forth 15 times. So that's just not true. I see. And there are no, no policeman has ever called me to discuss any of this at any time. You know, that's interesting because I see a lot of people going in on the women and saying that they're liars, they're doing this for money. So there is no civil case or criminal case pending. There was a, there's a civil case that 31 years ago, it's a, it's a, I don't want to talk about her history or what she's, a woman who I've never met wants $10 million. It'll be, I mean, I'm sure it, so that's the civil case, but that's it. And that'll, the judge will throw that out, the two year statute of limitation. So it, no, I, don't, I didn't escape anything. I came to Bali because my school, Tantris, was having a teacher training. And I was, a, I had, I was gonna go either to India, to an ashram or to Bali to get out of the media. And when I came to Bali, I, you know, I met many friends here and I came back home and I went back and then back home, back and forth, fourth the fifth time I got here. I started to build a house and then I bought into a company I started working and I found all kinds of, my kids love it here. They've both been here a couple times a piece. Um, they were supposed to be here now. Um, so no, I'm in, I'm in uh, yoga and vegan Disneyland. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a, you know, a great place to retire at 62, although I don't know how to retire. And again, I have an office in LA, which I frequent, it's closed now since COVID. But I built that office in LA. I had parties there to open the office. And the idea is to build bridges. We have 13 offices in Asia, but to build bridges between China and America and Asia. White men in suits do not do a good job, it turns out, in representing our interests in China or, or in Asia. And so in Asia, if for instance, in China, a billion people watch the rap of China, a billion people. And our artists and our black culture is so popular. And the white men in suits do not represent them well. LeBron made more money in China last year than he did in America. There's no one representing, there's no one home. And so we have 60 agents in China. And the idea of building bridges is something I've always liked doing. I just want to say one last thing, too, because I know we have to get going. But as a woman, I know it's really difficult for women to speak up when they feel like something's happened, especially when it involves a celebrity, just because of the level of people who are going to say, oh, she's lying. She wants attention. Um, and even just the threat of not even being able to work in this industry anymore. So what do you think is the motivation for these women to come forward and make these accusations? I don't think it's for me to say the motivation. Uh, there's a lot of psychological uh, profiles and there's studies. And, and um, a lot of people want relevance. And I'm not suggesting that people want to be famous or want money. But you can make that assumption if you like, that some people may want to be famous and even infamous as, a, and I don't wanna, you know, you can, what I'd like for you to do, maybe, if you're interested, is read some of the stories written by the black investigative journalists that, and then call the witnesses yourselves. Let, call their parents. I'm not suggesting that we, I said God would straighten it out and I asked the guru, would God come in the form of an investigative journalist? For me, that investigative journalist, I thought was Oprah. And she did say, that the stories had so many inconsistencies. But then to say, step back and still support the movement. I like the narrative, believe the women. 
I want to continue to promote that narrative. I want women to feel comfortable speaking up. But just because someone speaks up doesn't mean that you have to give it an echo. They should have freedom to share their experiences, even if they're 30 or 40 years old. But if you find there's so many inconsistencies, maybe you shouldn't print those stories. I say, there is something also. I say, and I hate to say this. I say listen to women, but don't but believe all proof. Listen to all women, believe all proof. I, I don't want to say anything too harsh because I, I do feel that it's my job to defend and to push this, uh, th th this agenda forward to get more women to speak and to feel comfortable. And also, like I said, what I teach my daughters, there is toxic femininity and we do want them to have boundaries. We don't want them to realize later, maybe I shouldn't have and I wish I hadn't. And uh, for various different reasons, people can regret an experience. And uh, if you just, you know, I don't want to talk about how many times people have been to jail or to mental institutions or how many people they've accused, that stuff's available. And of course, with so many compromising situations, you could find yourself or any rock star or any jerk off like I was could find themselves here where I am talking about this in such um, graphic terms. Right. Did Oprah Gale reach out to you? Did Oprah reach out to you? Um, I don't want to say too much about Oprah, but I will say that the minute I knew that she was involved in the documentary, I felt that she was my savior. And I told everyone, my daughters and everyone, oh my God, she's going to walk away and tell the world why. Because she was interested in the truth. She called, of the 30 witnesses, none of whom appear in the movie, 30 witnesses that I gave to the producers. They want to interview me, but they didn't want to interview the 30 witnesses. Me talking to you is not as good as if you talk to Drew Dixon's assistant who was there the whole time. Me talking to you is not as good as the other seven uh, witnesses. Because me talking, I'm defending myself. No man has been good at that. But if an ordained minister who happens to be a woman tells you a story, it may be helpful in you uh, not having a conclusion where I'm a monster. I, you know, it's interesting, though, is it a yogi thing? Because I haven't heard you call these women a liar per se. Because I don't know that anybody, I don't know who believes they're a liar and who has this recollection from 30 years ago. And I don't want to re-victimize women. Hurt people are hurting people in some cases. I don't want to, I don't want to promote anything negative and I don't want to get in the mud with the accusers. The only reason I told, the only reason I gave them 30 witnesses against the three leads in the movie is because I have daughters. The only reason I took nine lie detectors, Texas, I took those tests and didn't give them to anybody. I did those for my daughters. And every more, you know, but the first time I came back from the test, Ming said, how'd you do? I started laughing. I said, you know, I did well, I passed the test. And then I started going every day and, 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 and she'd look at me and she would laugh because my daughter knows me. Kamora knows me. I'd go back to their house after the test and they would, you know, you don't pass, you don't pass nine lie detector tests that are 95% accurate by maybe the most respected person in the country or one of the most respected polygraph people in the country, unless you believe yourself. So whatever I did unintentionally, I believe the women and I believe me in some cases. I believe Jane Lamette. That's who I believe. So basically, And I put her, because I believe her story. It, I read it, it breaks my heart. She said she thought I might turn violent. She said she was fearful and did what I said. I didn't know. I didn't know. And I never heard from her that this is how she felt. And when I read the story, it brought me to tears. So I don't want to re-victimize these women at all. So, so I'm getting the feeling that you know you were a shitty person, but you, you weren't a rapist. That's what you're- I was a horrible person. Okay. That was my- <laughs> I mean, not horrible. We didn't know any better. I just, I'll just tell you, I was just watching Boomerang. And this is honest. I just watched Boomerang. I was a very, you know, I went out. I had more foursomes than most guys had one girl. I dated, you know, Japanese and Korean and Chinese and, and then Swedish and Dutch and German and African. I've dated supermodels from everywhere. And I, and I, if I had a nickel for every girl who didn't get what they deserved out of our relationships, I'd be Richard and Puffy or something, but 
So I disappointed a lot of people and I hurt some people. Well, I'm not a rapist and I'm not violent. I've never been violent. And I've nor have I even um, ever felt, ever felt that someone thought that. My assistant who's been with me for 40 years has never heard that. She lived with me. She worked out of my apartment. She saw the world, women coming and going. She sent every flower. Leo has never heard that. Puffy has never heard that. Nobody in the fashion industry, and I knew every agent, I knew the owners of every agency. I judged the Ford any elite supermodel contest. I went to all the Miss Universe contests. I was the judge with Trump. I judged Miss, I dated two Miss Universe, two Miss USAs. I've never heard this characterization of me as this monster. And neither has any friend of mine. So hearing it at 60, it broke, it's, it broke my heart. It was one of the most traumatizing experiences, maybe the most traumatizing experience of my life. And I deeply regret for those women who feel victimized. I deeply regret that. And I don't know how else I can do, but just maybe try to make it right by be part of the, the shift in consciousness that will, that will be more inclusive. For yeah, women. I want to ask about that when it comes to hip hop, because you know, hip hop, you know, how does hip hop come to a reckoning about the way we did used to treat women? Because it was toxic, you know, the music in the culture, it was rape culture. It was and still toxic. do, still it, do, not just did, but. No, it was worse, it was way worse though. Like, but it's still bad. It's pretty bad. Yeah, it's bad, bad. but it was, it, was, it was way worse back then. We talked to women violently, pouring drinks on them. Like, like it, it's a lie to act like hip hop wasn't that way. So how do we deal with No, that? no, no, we were, listen, but, it's, but thousands of years, I, you know, I don't want us to make this about what black people did when I hung out with the rock stars and I saw them. Yeah, America. And they got stories on stories on stories. Nobody investigating. I'm not, I'm not asking anybody to, to, re, to, to relitigate their lives either. But these women who wrote these stories, who grew up, you know, perhaps even almost my age, they didn't, the rock stars were not so good. White men, that's why it was all white men and me. Mm -hmm. There was 25 white men and I was the first black man. They spent a little bit of money looking to get me. They called everybody. Allison Williams told me, I did her radio show uh, yesterday. She told me that she got four or five calls and people would say things like, if you just tell your story, you'll help your sisters. She said, I, I produced Just Call My Name, 1984, the record. And I produced uh, I Need Your Love and other stuff with Allison over the years. And, She's told me how many times she got called. Everybody in my, everybody I know has gotten called. And everybody that I've known have been, um, co -work, not Corey's, promoted that they would, be, they would look great, that it would be important when you come forward. And there was a time two and a half years ago that everybody who came forward was never questioned. Not one woman has been accused and, and um, has, you know, had any legal or other ramification for making false accusations. So I'm not suggesting that we need to go on that either. And we need to bring balance and dialogue and build bridges and start a new course. And I think that what's happened with Me Too has been very productive. And I'm very uh, in support of its continued work. But I'm aware, acutely aware, that there is a tremendous amount of, of, of collateral damage as well. Small compared to, so I told a woman, because I wrote my life story too, I didn't put it out, and there's a chapter called The Awakening, right? And what I've learned in this experience. And I was telling a publisher about this, and I told this publisher about my history and how I felt somewhat like a victim. And, and then I, I thought, you know, I don't like saying that because I have mixed feelings about it. She said, women have been sitting on it for thousands of years, just sit on it. You know, the collateral damage in every rep. Ashley Judd told me, I said, Ashley, you know me. I took Ashley Judd on a date. You know, you know me. You know I would never be. She said, the revolution is bloody because she's one of the leaders. And I was like, but can't you, like, she said, the revolution is bloody. And since it was happening to me, I couldn't accept that, of course, there's some collateral damage. In every great revolution, there is. And I, because I'm collateral damage, in my opinion, I, I, I maybe don't real. I, I do realize how great and how important this revolution is and how necessary 
it is. It is definitely necessary. And I do want to say, though, I can never judge how somebody would treat somebody else just because of how they treated me, because I know there's people who have done things to other people. Just because they treated me well doesn't mean that they didn't do something else. So I don't like to categorize, well, this didn't, I didn't do this to this person, so how could I have done that? You know, and I people, certainly am not saying that. I'm telling right. you that. When I mention all the famous, or all the women I've dated over the years, and I mention what they think about me, they don't think I'm capable of being a monster. Mm -hmm. That's true. And I just say that because it is, it does matter that you've had so many compromised situations. And, and, and character witness matter a little bit. But the 30 witnesses I gave were not character witnesses. They were there at every stage. And they heard different stories over these 30 or 40 years. So they've heard it differently. And they've repeated it. So I certainly can't say that Ray Don Chong or Robin Givens or Sherry, they would all say I was a person, most likely. Right, like I they would all say that I was always a gentleman. But that doesn't, that doesn't vindicate me from other accusations, no. Yeah, I've got three more questions because there's been women with famous voices who've said things like Russell has said inappropriate things to me. Like Amanda Seal said, Russell said inappropriate things to me. I've heard, you know, other women say that. You said inappropriate things to them. Like inappropriate, like what? Well, like have, have well, she said that. Well, look, I've said I'm a deaf comedy jam man. I got a dirty mouth and I've been inappropriate my whole life. I've been inappropriate and times unconsciously callous. Never intentionally callous, ever. I've never been violent. I've never been a rapist. So I've been a lot of things, but I certainly never, ever intended to hurt anyone. And I don't believe that um, the net effect of my, my work would be judged as hurtful, uh, but there are people who could have misconstrued and then they could then think that. But were there a camera in the room, no one would say that I was intentionally hurtful. Okay, and, and I, I want you to answer these two more questions because I, I don't know if I, if I got an answer. America, how do we deal with the shitty behavior that we used to display as men? Because I feel like the same way white people got to atone for racism, men, we got to atone for our bullshit. How do we do that? Well, you know, I believe that uh, we've had a, we. We learned this is not a black experience only. In mm -hmm. fact, we didn't learn it you know, on our own. I think that we should be aware as we are more now, I don't, not only because we're threatened, men are in Hollywood afraid to come out the office. They don't know what's gonna happen, what they did, what they might get accused of. That's one thing and that, that's good because it's a wake up call. But the bridge building and the shift in consciousness, now how do we hire women? How do we empower women? What roles can we find for them that they really suit and would make us and our companies better. When can they? When I hired Carmen Asher as the president of Def Jam, I was very proud. I, I hired her because she was good, and I wasn't proud until someone pointed out that she was a woman. When Faith Newman was the head of AR and when Donna Moore was the head of marketing, and when Johnny Walker was the head of promotion, I didn't hire them for any, but I was lucky enough to have the foresight to see them as they were, as talented and smart and thoughtful leaders. So they led their departments. I want to be more like that more often, and I want to help men be more like that. And I want right. to support the growth of women in industry, and I want to support the growth of women in general. And I want us to be sensitized in ways that we might not have been. And include, you know, women in the, and include women in the conversation. When you want to say, what can we do for women? Let them also let you know what can be done for us to feel more empowered and for us to be able to express ourselves in the environment and have equality. And you can do that financially too with equal pay for women for the same jobs that men do also. Like I said, it was 20 some odd years ago that I went to Washington for equal pay for women. Mm -hmm. and I've always supported not only that, but in every instance, I've you know I've been a person who promoted equality. I've I don't tried. mean you. I don't mean you in particular. No, no, I'm saying I'm saying yeah. <laughs> I'm saying no. I agree wholeheartedly, and I think we're coming into our own. In all of what's happening now, I believe there's an awakening on the planet. When we talk about black equality or people being sensitized to the suffering of black people, it's kind of twisting everything. We're sensitized to the plight of all the underserved communities. 
women have been for thousands of years treated unfairly and lived in an unjust environment. And I have participated in that unjust uh, and unequal society. What can I do to make it better? How can I help my brothers make it better? It's, it's something that I give a lot of thought to and I wanna be useful. And, and I've had so many conversations with lots of the women who are the leaders and the activists uh, uh, for this movement. And I'm just finding a way to be useful. Do you feel like a lot of people are pointing fingers and, and not necessarily, because you, know, you talk about all the things that you've done in your, in your career, you know, go to Congress, you've hired all these women. Do you feel like people are, are losing sight of all the things that you did do because of what's- No, I, you know, listen, I, I told myself when I couldn't make sense of this, and in my meditation, I realized it was a karmic effect for having been a shitty guy, for having been a womanizer. It's a karmic effect. Like I said, the police have never called me for anything. That the one civil suit I have will be thrown out and it's ridiculous. And you, if you read it, you'd laugh. I mean, I don't want to call her, but you know. So I don't, I've not really faced heavy, oh, I lost all my five charities. Mm -hmm. I lost so many executives, some are still on the payroll, but I had to lose all my companies and all my charities. It cost, uh, uh, I lost my company that was all based on advertising. I lost 30 million bucks. I don't have a lot of money. I don't need money. I'm a billionaire and God's got me and I will rebuild. But I lost a lot. And I just said it's a comic effect for having been a shitty guy. And also it's just, and, and I feel blessed from the experiences that taught me what I learned. And what I've learned, I'm sure will be beneficial to men and to the planet more so than if I had not had these experiences. Only through struggle I've learned in my whole life, never through ease. So these experiences, uh, hopefully I can communicate them in ways and use them in ways that will benefit others. What do you mean when you say you don't got a lot of money, Russ? <laughs> what's, what's, well, no, what's no, 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 I, no, I, no, you'd be surprised. I don't want to discuss money specifically, but you know, I had five philanthropic um, organizations. I want to keep them going, even if my name's not on them. I had so many uh, uh, companies that were funded that, it, that needed to continue to grow, that the advertising was pulled, especially the all Def Digital. You don't know, I funded that company. So I don't, you know, I don't. If I had more, I'd give more. I want to make more to give more. I have uh, one more thing I want to share with you that I'm going to come back and talk about. I want to fund, we talked about this bill, and I want to come back to the bill as we close. It is very, very important that we defund, they didn't use the language, but to defund to some degree police and underwrite community organizations which really fight crime in our communities. That is necessary, and it's very necessary that we get prosecutors the power they need, separate from the political and, con and uh, other controls, including the police unions over their right. I told you, if a prosecutor uh, puts you in jail, they get a feather in their cap. They put a policeman in jail, they get their neck chopped off. We have to change that. It's the only way we'll ever have police accountability. So I wanna push that bill. I wanna get as many, I've spoken to Snoop, and I've spoken to 50, and I've spoken to to kill a mic and all the OG and I spoke to all these guys. I'm just getting started. I want us to make that bill loud and make it clear that we want those components in that bill. I saw on TV something that was disturbing this morning. I saw them talking about the bill. They were talking about sensitivity training and all the other stuff that we've seen in the past. But they didn't mention those components. We don't want those things cut out the bill. Mm -hmm. Those are the highlights of the bill. So I want to be part of it, not necessarily personally part of it. I've spoken to all the congressmen long before this bill was created and I've been pushing it. I just want to see it happen. And, and so I want that to happen. And the other thing that I talked about as we close is I really want us to change our diets and prepare for COVID two. Mm -hmm. And just in general to change our eating habits because the, it is the animal product that is the cause of all of the pre-existing health conditions. And you'll read about it and you can see it in those documentaries, but certainly my book covers it. It gives you recipes, it gives you all kinds of ways out. 
I just want us to make it part of lifestyle so that we can be healthy and live. My heart had been broken. I text Andre every day. Wow. I text Andre Harrell every single day. And wow. half the time, I actually believe he's getting them. So I'm a little fucked up over this. And I've been fucked up. And I've cared about this for so long. And now I'm even more passionate that I have to get our people off this poison that they're selling us. This is my final question, man. Eckhart Tolle. Eckhart Tolle said, life will give you whatever experience is most helpful for the evolution of your consciousness. How do you know this is the experience you need? Because this is the experience you are having at the moment. With that said, how is your consciousness elevated because of everything you've been going through? Everything. You know, I have seconds of presence and awareness. After meditation, sometimes where I just sit blissful. And I have more seconds of presence and awareness through my practice, uh, through some of the comic work I do, and through my meditation itself. I feel like God has given me uh, a chance to speed up my evolution. I feel like I'm where God wants me, and I feel like I can be useful. And never mind useful like an aspiration, uh, my intent. Uh, my intent is more pure, I think, and my experiences have helped me find me some, I think. And Eckhart Tolle, you know, uh, I read that book. It, it was the first time I truly understood yoga, this idea of awareness and presence. After reading all the yoga sutras and scriptures, I read that book, uh, The Power of Now. And he really helped me quite a bit to intellectualize, at least, or to understand what we all do everything for. Every moment, every second, every effort we make is for more presence, more awareness. And that got told, helped me to understand that. And then by intellectualizing it, I started to work more intently on it. So I'm deeply appreciative of that book. Um, I, I don't know if you know, I gave Oprah that book. No one had ever heard of it. Mm. I read that book and it changed my life. So, uh, I'm glad you brought him up because his uh, explanation for Christ consciousness or Nirvana or Samadhi or Takwa, or whatever the different prophets referred to that, his explanation made, made a big difference in my life. All right. Well, Russ, well, thank you, man. We appreciate you. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure talking to you on and off air, man. Absolutely. I love you. God bless you. Thank you so much for having me on. And thank you. And thank you, Angela. Okay, thank you, Russell. All right. Thank you, Russell. Russell Simmons.